So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Let my love look like you and what you made of. How you lived. No matter if it's the uh, coronavirus or something else, fear, fear, fear drives so many of us today. Is that not the case? And we see it, we go to the stores and they're empty, and I'm just, again, taken aback. Uh, I've said it for years, and I know this is going to sound maybe off, but I think we're no longer living in a thinking nation. We're living in an emotional nation. So if it feels bad, ah, bad. If it feels good, ah, good. And that's what the, how we make our choices. And that's what drives us. And unfortunately, the media has been shown over and over and over again to propagate, show fake news. And people are moved by it. And like I said, we're no longer like common sense is gone, seems like. And I hope I'm terribly, terribly wrong, but that's the way it seems. But even if it's true, we are you know, helter-skelter going about and all concerned and afraid, and we lose perspective. We lose what is truly, truly important. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And did you notice, singular, one angel was sent. <laughs> Just take, look at the text again in Daniel 6. An angel no lion. <laughs> the Lord is absolutely sovereign. We need to stand steady, steady in who we know the Lord to be. Because when we do not, fear drives us. And once fear is the driving force, everything starts going down. Not just our thinking, our actions start going down, our decisions start going down, our perspective, everything goes downhill. And then we begin to try to protect ourselves, protect ourselves, protect ourselves. And then we can't even give ourselves away because I got to protect myself. And we're not living for the Lord anymore. We're living for self and it seems so reasonable. It seems so reasonable to protect ourselves. Now, obviously, we don't want to be foolish and go and do dumb things to put ourselves in danger. You know, again, use of common sense. But this self-protection, this self-protection is um, it's so terrible, so terrible. You know, can you imagine if Jesus self-protected himself all the time? We'd be destined for hell. We, there'd be no hope for us. No, no. He gave himself away. And you and I need to be careful that all the news and all the stuff that's going on, whether it's the coronavirus or anything else, does not make us stumble in such a way that we are no longer there for people. We are there for self. Uh, and this is from the very beginning, right? From Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Lamech and all throughout history. Self-protection keeps people from living for the Lord. Jesus Christ came to die for our sins, rose again from the dead to set us free. To set us free so that we wouldn't have to even be afraid of death. So that we wouldn't even be afraid of death. Can you imagine having that type of freedom? Wow, then to live freely. Not stupidly. Freely. With wisdom and strength. And life to give to others. That's what Jesus came to do. The Apostle Paul is, of course, one of the champions of Christianity, though people reject him, it's uh, unbelievable, but that's the way it is. And this message and this work of God, 
the gospel is so powerful and so fundamental. It is the greatest news anybody can receive. Why? Because it's the difference between eternity forever and ever and ever in the place of condemnation, hell, or forever and ever and ever in heaven. That's the gospel. And so the Apostle Paul was like communicating it, communicating it because that's what people need. Right. And some were perverting the gospel, uh, saying, no, you have to do this and this and this before you actually become a believer and before you're actually saved. And the Apostle Paul was outraged. And so in Galatians chapter one. Verse 8 and 9, he says one of the most intense, powerful statements you will hear anywhere. And he was so adamant and so clear-headed, he wasn't concerned about anybody's political stance, anybody's rejection. And No, here's the truth. And look at what he says, Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary... To what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Basically, let him go to hell. And then he repeated it. Verse 9. As we have said before, so we say to you again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Okay. And so now he says in verse 10. What does this show? Does this show that I'm afraid of man? Does this show that I'm afraid of the consequences who might, might come to me? No. Verse 10. For I am not, I am not seeking the favor of men or of God. And am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not have been a bondservant of Christ. Listen. The word of God. The works of God. Go contrary To our fallen human nature. They go contrary. To what the way we normally think. Usually think. It goes contrary to the decisions we make. It goes contrary to everything inside of us. And because of that. There's going to be resistance against God. Against what he has to say. Against what he has said. You see. From the very beginning. And so then there's going to be this tendency, this fear that if I live for God, I'm going to lose out. I'm going to uh, all these other bad things. So, no. And then it, it, uh, the gospel hits our pride. It hits, it damages our pride. What? I haven't been good enough? My work isn't good enough? Nope. <laughs> the best things we can do. Are like filthy rags, the Bible says. I don't like that. You see, it hits at the human pride, you see. And so there's going to be resistance and literally anger when we really get down to it. In fact, that's what got Jesus crucified, right? Jesus was doing all kinds of good things. I mean, he was feeding 4,000, 5,000, walking on water, raising the dead, healing all kinds of people. That's not what got him in trouble. What got him in trouble was speaking and living the truth. You see? But again, we are tempted to self-protect and not speak of the things of God. So I ask you, what fears are driving you? What fears are driving you? Do you fear What people are going to say about you? Do you fear that if you follow God, you're going to miss out? Right? And by the way, there's many distractions that come along to distract us from the things of God. And then those distractions are really great, awesome, fun, pleasurable things. And they can take us away. But fear, fear drives us so much of the time. 
And when there's fear, there's no freedom. There's no freedom to really live with gusto, with freedom, and really go out there and live wholeheartedly. No. Fear. I gotta protect myself. I gotta protect myself. I gotta say everything right. I gotta dress everything right. I gotta, uh, and all this. What drives you? What we find in the book of Acts is the Apostle Paul, and he's done all these missionary journeys, and he's done his third, he's finished, and now he's on his way back to Jerusalem, and he wants to give a good, good report. And there's all kinds of churches that have been established already. And he's in a hurry to get back to uh, Jerusalem because he wants to get there by the day of Pentecost. And as we say in Acts chapter 2, the church was born on the day of Pentecost. And it was about 25 years earlier that the church had been born and the Apostle Paul had gone all over the place and planted a lot of churches. To go back, Pentecost was the celebration of the first fruits, right? Here's the promise of the coming harvest. And so Paul wanted to go back, hey, look at all these churches, believers in Jerusalem. God is at work. The gospel is spreading and it is powerful, powerful. And he wanted to go back to Jerusalem. But before he got there, uh, he stopped in Miletus, this little uh, town off uh, in the Aegean uh, Sea. And there he called for the elders uh, of Ephesus. Remember Ephesus, that would have been a big riot and it's uh, I'm, I'm unbelievable. But he called for the elders. And basically he communicates this. Listen, guys, listen. Communicating God's word and works. God's word and works must be above, listen to this, it must be above social safety, social comforts, and social pleasures. Communicating God's word and works must be above all that. And so that's what we're going to find out in this passage. So let me read the passage, Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 17. Now, uh, before we get started, I want you to note a couple of things. And this is the way I kind of broke down the passage. Look at verse 18. Uh, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was. You see that? Past tense, I was. Now look at verse 22. And now behold, bound in spirit I am, present tense, right? Now, I want you to look at verse 25. And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer future. What am I saying? Past, present, future. That's how I'm breaking down this passage. Verses 17 through 21, not self-protecting, but serving the Lord. This is the way I was, right? And then verse 22, 24, valuing God's call to testify of Jesus presently, like in verse 22. And then 25 to 27, staying steady with God's word and works. I will no longer continue to live the same way, committed to communicating the words and works of God. So let me read it. Uh, starting in verse uh, 17. From my leaders, he sent to Ephesus. Ephesus was like a day in inland. And remember, they had no cars, no highways, no freeways. <laughs> had to walk or donkey, right? So it was about a, a, a day away. From my leaders, he sent uh, to Ephesus and called for the elders, the Literally, the presbyters, the overseers, the, the ones that uh, uh, led the church. Uh, and by the way, see, no, plural elders. The church singular. We'll make a note of that later. Verse 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink back, shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. Solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith 
in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound in spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bounds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I might finish the course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose or counsel of God. So I want you to know that this uh, section is about the Apostle Paul addressing the leadership of the church. The leadership of the church. Now, in many, in all ways, all Christians are somewhat leaders. All Christians. Every one of us who's trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ are leaders in a way, right? Because the non-believers are lost. And in some way, we have information for them that they need. So really, this passage applies to all believers, but especially, especially those who want to lead in the church. Because that's what he says. He called the presbyters, the elders of the church. Um, so we need to be careful. There's a high price. There is a high price to pay to be in leadership, really in any leadership, right? And you want to be a leader of a company, you probably need to work 80 hours a week and don't complain. That's the way it is. You want to make 100,000, 200,000, 100 million, a million dollars, 80 hours a week. You ready for that? And don't complain. Uh, but that's physical work or mental work. But when it comes to spiritual work, you want to be a leader? Be ready to pay a price. And I'm telling you from experience, be ready to pay a price. And that's who Paul is, is calling on the elders of the church. And so he tells them, verse 18, and I want you to know, and I had to look this up like several times to make sure I go, is this really what it means? Yep. You yourself know from the first day that I uh, set foot in Asia, how? In other words, what's the manner of life that I lived? You know because you saw me. You have eyewitness experience of my own life. You know how I lived the Christian life and how I lived. What kind of a person I was. It's not just talk. Talk is cheap. But you saw how I lived. Uh, how I was with you the whole Time I was there. It wasn't just Sunday morning. The whole time. And how was that, Paul? How did you live? Verse 19. Here it is. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. Hmm. With all humility. It's a quality of unselfishness. It's not about, I've got the position, now submit to me. No. The Apostle Paul saying, the needs of the people are more important than my own needs. You see. With all humility. Uh, Self-effacement. You see. It was not about Paul, but about the Lord. You see, you want to be a servant? You're second fiddle. Now, people might put you as a first fiddle, but you dare not forget that you are a servant. Servant, serving the Lord Jesus. And the Apostle Paul was telling the Ephesian elders, you saw me do that. It's not just talk, right? Mm-hmm. 
I got plenty of stories on that, but I'm not going to go there. But that's how you do. You want to be a leader? You need to be serving with humility. With tears. That's what he says. With tears. What does that mean? That means that the hurts and pains and lostness of the people affected Paul. He opened up his heart to them. It wasn't just that he, hey, here's the information. Brr, brr, brr. Here's Fox News. Here's CNN. Here's MSNBC. Here's the news. Brr, brr, brr. No, no, no. Uh -uh. What I'm communicating to you is of all importance, and I beg you, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with tears. People hurting. People needing the Lord. You see? You want to be a Christian leader? Then have a heart, a powerful, passionate heart to communicate the wonderful love of God, you see, with tears. Uh, it's not just passing on information. And then with tribulations. Can you imagine? You want to be a Christian leader? Get ready for tribulation in your life. I'm not going to sign anywhere. <laughs> but the Apostle Paul was talking to the leaders. You know how I did it. And it says right there, with tribulation. That's how you carry out the ministry. And by the way, did you know? From who? From his own people. From his own people. Paul was a Jew. It was the Jews that plotted against him. Wanted to kill him. Well, ouch. You know, if some stranger, somebody you, you don't even know wants to hurt you, it's like, well, you know, he's part an idiot. But when your own people, your own people, wow, that hurts. The Apostle Paul was saying, you know, Ephesians, it's not just talk. You saw how I lived life, right? And then he says, it's very key, by the way, in verse 20. Verse 20, look at the first part. How I did not shrink from declaring, Right? Look again uh, at verse 27. For I did not shrink from declaring. What does that mean? Because he repeats it right in the text at the first and at the very end. I did not protect myself. I didn't just live in, live in fear of what were going to be said about me. What they were going to do to me. Uh, I better not say that because it might offend people. I better just have positive messages. I better not talk about the wrath of God and the judgment of God. Because, you, know, you got to make people happy, comfortable in the church. Paul says, no, I did not hide. I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that's profitable. You know, I mean, with kids, sometimes we have to realize that, right? They don't like what we have to tell them or what we're having them do. But we as parents should know what's profitable for them, what's really good for them, right? The Apostle Paul says, I, I didn't shrink back from what was profitable. And teaching you publicly and from house to house. You know, today if we go share the gospel. What can we expect if we knock on doors? What's the worst thing that can happen? The worst thing that can happen today. You probably get out. That's the worst. Oh, no, no, something worse. They look at you, slam the door. That's the worst you can get. Paul says, I wasn't afraid of that. Publicly, I'm not hiding anything. And I went from house to house. I did not shrink back. And what was the message? What was the message? Verse 21, solemnly, seriously testifying to both Jews and Greeks. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Of repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance towards God? Are you kidding me? Uh, Artemis. Was the goddess, the famous goddess of the whole region. There was a huge, tem a huge temple for her. And all the other different gods. Repentance towards God? 
Yeah. You need to repent from worshiping Artemis, worshiping any other god. Turn from there, let him go, and turn to God. It's like, what? What? That's right. That's right. Repent towards God. And not only that, but faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only Savior. You mean no other God? You mean God is, uh, Jesus is the only way? Yep. Kill him. It's okay. I'm telling you the truth. Wow. I did not shrink back from that. Unpopular, but it's the truth. The truth. That's the way I was. And now, how am I now? Now comes the next section. The present tense. Verse 22. And now, behold. <laughs> nothing has changed, man. This is my life. Elders, you want to be leaders? Here's the example. Look at me as the example. Wow. Wow. And now behold, bound in spirit, bound in the spirit, I believe, the Holy Spirit, leading him. I, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. <laughs> well, some of us are a little neurotic about planning for the future, right? Everything's got to be so guaranteed that it's going to turn out that way. And if it doesn't, I'm not going to sign on anything. I'm not. I'm <sighs> we have to be absolutely sure, sure, sure that it's going to turn out the way we want it to be. Good luck. It ain't going to happen. The apostle Paul says, I don't know what's going to be. All I do know, here's what I do know. I mean, my goodness. Verse 23. You want to be in Christian leadership? Verse 23. Except the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. <laughs> All right. You want to be a Christian leader? Uh, chains and afflictions, thorns and thistles. Is that not what God told Adam? Because of our fallen nature, listen, man, there's no way around problemas. There's no way around difficulties and pain. We live in a fallen world. And we men, especially we men, need to man up. And says, come what may, I'm going to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Chains and afflictions. Come on. Jesus is with me. Jesus is with me. Daniel said, O king, my God sent an angel. That's it. That's all he needs. Because he is with me. Men, men up. Live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Come what may. That's what the Apostle Paul is telling the church leaders of Ephesus. That's my current experience. You know my past. This is my current experience. But... Here's what drives Paul. Here's what drives Paul right here. Verse 24. Look at it carefully. Men, especially, look at it carefully. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel, of the grace of God. The greatest work God has done is not creation. As awesome as it is, trillions and trillions of stars, he names them all, and not one of them falls. That's not the greatest work he's ever done. The greatest work is dying for you. And for me. Mind blowing. That's the gospel. And it's the sheer, sheer grace of God. That's why the, the, the John, uh, the apostle John in his uh, gospel, grace upon grace that we receive from Jesus Christ. 
And you see, when we understand that, when we understand that, there's nothing else to live for that's more valuable than that. I don't care if I suffer. I don't care if I, you know, malign and, and said dumb things about me, lies about me. I'm going to live for Jesus. You see, I don't count my life dear to me. So I may finish, I may accomplish, I may fulfill what God has called me to do. And what is that, Paul? Preach the gospel of the grace yes. of God. There's nothing greater. You see, that's his passion. That's his drive. You see, and so that's the way it is. And if that wasn't enough. Now, what about the future? More hurt. More hurt. Listen, Paul knew that the elders loved Paul. They loved him dearly. And now he's going to tell him, I, I got something more painful to tell you. We're not going to see each other anymore. Really? Yeah. I know you love me. And I love you dearly. But I'm not going to see you anymore. You're not going to see my face anymore. And that's why he says, and behold, verse 25. And now behold, I know that all of you, I know all of you, I know, I know you personally. Among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Hmm. You ever say goodbye to someone that you really love? I mean, you really loved. Huh. That's what Paul is saying. I'm not going to see you again, man. But let's be clear about something. I have a clear conscience of the blood of all men because, why? Because I didn't hold back from preaching the gospel. I did not hold back from telling you that Jesus Christ came, died for our sins, and rose again from the dead. That is the gospel. And so that is now in verse 26. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Because I preached to Greeks and to Jews. In that sense, it was to all people. For the Jews, there was only two types of people, right? The Jews and the Greeks, everybody else. Paul says, I preached to everybody. Didn't matter to me. And so, I have a clear conscience. But what's the main point? The main point, the last verse. The last verse. For I did not shrink there it is again. I did not self-protect. I did not say number one is number one. I am number one. I'm going to, what's best for me, what's going to give me the most pleasure, what's going to give me the safest, what's going to make me happy. No. I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole will, counsel, purpose of God. Literally, the will of God in the Greek. Um... God revealed everything about himself. And sometimes those revelations are hard to uh, accept. Let me tell you a few things. Because he says the whole counsel of God. Right? The whole will of God. It's not just the gospel. All everything that's related to the gospel he revealed it too. But there's some things like. For instance. God's absolute holiness. Uh, what does that mean? Such holiness is beyond our human attainment. We can't attain it. The absolute holiness of God. That means not the, the tiniest little sin cannot live with him. Because it would cause an eternal explosion. The tiniest little sin. If you have sinned, even just the smallest sin in the whole world, that's enough to separate you from God for eternity. That's how holy he is. I don't like that. Because all my efforts, all my attempts to do what is right is never, never, ever good enough. Never, ever. That's why Jesus had to die for us. And that's where, again, it offends the human pride. The absolute holiness of God is very interesting. When Jesus came in Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 
Verse 17, Matthew 5, verse 17. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law but to, uh, or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is accomplished. A little stroke in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Jesus is saying, the law of God has to be accomplished perfectly. Who can do that? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. That's what Jesus was trying to tell them. That's why you need a Savior. Because the holiness of God requires absolute perfection. Verse 19. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps it and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And who can do that? Verse 20 kind of solidifies nobody can. The scribes and the Pharisees were the more religious, the most holiest people. Everybody held them to the highest standards, and they were the highest. Look at verse 20. For I say unto you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Oops. Bye-bye. Nobody can do it. Hmm. The absolute holiness of God. And really, that's what offended the scribes and the Pharisees. Because they told you, what? Man, we even tithe our salt and pepper, man. We tithe even our spices on our fajitas. And that's not good enough? No. No. See, absolute holiness. Paul did not shrink back from saying that. How about his absolute justice? The Bible shows about the absolute justice, meaning, meaning that the tiniest little sin deserves an eternal punishment. The justice of God is absolute. No loopholes. No, my compadre is, oh, I have a, a friend in position. My friend is the president. Doesn't matter. Now, absolute justice. You've done something wrong, for eternity you will be judged. Okay. Who wants to hear that message? The Apostle Paul said, I did not shrink back from teaching you the whole will of God. But then, uh, by the way, this is Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 1, because uh, we, as human beings, we don't like that. We, we absolutely do not like that, the justice of God, right? Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Look at this. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, uh, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. You see that? Human beings, we suppress the truth that God is absolutely holy and there's absolutely justice with God. We don't like that. Because that which is known of God is evident to them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So that they are without excuse. You look, just look at nature. Earthquakes and the ocean and tidal waves and tornadoes and you name it. Something inside says, man, there's judgment coming. Oh, no. No, no. No, we're not going to look at that. Man suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or gave thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts was darkened, professing to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Man suppresses the truth. And Paul says, I did not shrink back from telling you the whole counsel 
of God. And how about the absolute love of God? Uh, that too. It's amazing, amazing that God reveals his love and people still reject the love of God. It's just, that's our fallenness. That is our fallenness, brothers and sisters. Man is blinded by the effects of sin and thus reject God's love. And they rather love evil. You think I'm lying? Uh, John chapter 3, the gospel of John chapter 3. Uh, says this, John chapter 3, you know the, the famous verse, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, okay, and you, you know it, right? Sound like Joe Biden. No, wait a minute. <laughs> Let me quote the whole thing. <laughs> it just came to my mind. Bing! <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever still believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, right? But that's not the verse I want to look at. The verse I want to look at is verse 19. Look at verse 19. This is the judgment that light has come into the world and men agape love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. You see that? People don't like the light because their evil deeds are going to be exposed. And I want to keep my evil deeds. They bring me pleasure. They bring me satisfaction. My sins, oh, they're like my favorite pet. I need to keep them here. Don't take away my pet. Don't, don't, don't. Paul says, no, I did not shrink back. From telling you the truth. You see. Christian leaders. It's a high price to pay. Are you willing? Keep God. Keep communicating the word. And the works of God. Even if it costs you. Pain. And all kinds of things in this life. That's living. The Christian life. And expecting troubles. Because we do live in a fallen world. How then shall we live? Well, first of all, we have to be um, very aware of what drives us. And how did I begin this message? Fear. Fear drives us so much, right? Fear, 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 fear. I mean, my goodness, we spend lots of money. Making sure that we get not rejected. You know, thousands and thousands of dollars in all kinds of stuff. Because we fear man. We fear what people are going to say. Young ladies, you don't dress with revealing clothes, you're going to be left out. Young men, you don't talk foul language and you might be excluded from the group. Because you're afraid Oh, my. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. Uh, Proverbs 29 and verse 25. Very, very instructive. Of course, it's the Bible. Of course, it's instructive. Uh, <clears throat> Proverbs 29 and verse 25 says this. The fear of man brings a snare. But he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. The fear of man brings a snare. Once you begin to fear people, you're going downhill. It's downhill. It's not good. Because now, if you fear man, now you're going to say, well, what's going to win my acceptance before man? Uh, I've got to perform a certain level before I'm accepted. Uh, I better speak just the way they want me to so that I won't be rejected. And, and I got to do everything just so. It's like a religion to self. Religiously, we have to look a certain way. Why? Because we're fear of man. And then it's a, it's a trap because it's never good enough. It's never good enough. You, you can have the body of a Hollywood star and it will not be good enough. 
You know, you can make lots of money. It will not be good enough. You see? And then because you feel like a failure, no matter how successful you are outwardly, is still not feeling good inside, then you begin to judge other people. You begin to judge other people. Look what they're doing wrong, and they're doing wrong, and they're doing wrong, and they're doing wrong. You see? I'm okay because they're a mess. I'm not as big of a mess as you think I am. <laughs> and it's just it's a crazy trap downward. The fear of man. You see? There's no freedom to live for God. It's awful. It's a trap. You see? Sure failure when we live by the fear of man. So if that's the case, if you and I find ourselves fearing people too much, it's time to repent. It's time to repent. Repent from giving them so much power that only God should have. You see? Repent, Lord, forgive me. I'm giving people the power over my soul. And you haven't died. You're still alive. They're not God. Forgive me, God. And begin to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see? Begin to respect God. What God has to say. Not what people say. You see? That's the first thing. Fear of man. The Apostle Paul said, Christian leaders, remember you saw me. I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole truth, the word of God. Uh, <clears throat> that's the first application. The second is we need to learn how to give ourselves away, right? Give ourselves away uh, to represent God. Because you see, giving ourselves away, listen to this, giving ourselves away is the way to reflect God. God gives and gives and gives and gives. You see? And so when we give ourselves away, we're reflecting God. Remember, in the scripture says it's blessed, more blessed to give than to receive. By the way, it's actually there in um, Acts chapter 20, towards the, end of the, towards the end of chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And uh, <clears throat> verse 35, Paul is still addressing the, the Ephesians. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. There it is. You and I need to learn how to give ourselves away. You see, um, Matthew 10 Matthew 10, uh, verse like 35. Matthew 10, 39. Matthew 10, 39. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. <laughs> so paradoxical. So paradoxical. But you and I need to learn how to give our lives away for the sake of Christ. Not just for the sake of making people happy. No, no, no. For the sake of Christ. You see? That's actually how we gain life. That's how we get blessed. It's paradoxical. It doesn't make sense to me. But Jesus said that, and it's true. It's true. Uh, oh, there's countless stories. Uh, God is so wonderful, so wonderful, brothers and sisters. We need to learn how to reflect him. But we will not give ourselves away until we are secure in Jesus. Until we know him good enough to realize, yes, I know, I know that person did what's wrong. I'm going to give to them. I know, I know that person spoke against me. You know, I'm going to be kind to them. I know, I, we can, you know, we all have a list. Come on, don't look at me that way. You know you have a list. <laughs> that person, huh? that person, huh? that person. It's like, you know, no, we need to learn how to give ourselves away. Uh, <clears throat> in the name of Jesus, for Jesus' sake, not just to make people happy, but to communicate the love of God and the word of God, 
You see? So that's the second application. Give ourselves away in representing God. Finally, I mean, it's really basic, right? To share the word of God. It's not just doing good things for people. You know? There's many philanthropists in all the world that do incredible things for people. Never share the gospel. And when people die and they haven't received the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever in condemnation. No. We need to speak the word along with the helps of our hands. Hammering, painting, helping people, building house for them. Whatever it takes. But speak the word of God. You see, John, the gospel of John chapter 20, I now stop with this last one, I think. John 20, verse 31. The whole gospel of John, the gospel of John, here's the purpose. Here's right here. John wrote it for us. I mean, it's great in the Bible. Sometimes you don't get this clarity, but John says, look, here's why I wrote this. Here it is. Verse 31, John 20, verse 31. But these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing uh, you may have life in his name. That's what God wants of people. And that's what you and I what we should have as a value, that people will have life, that people will have life in the name of Jesus. You see? Because that's what people need. Apart from Jesus, we're left with, uh, life is terrible, uh, you know, or excitement over things that never will fulfill. People need the Lord, you see. So communicate the word of God. Now, if you haven't been in the Lord a long time, obviously you're not going to know the Bible that well, and that's okay, that's okay. But you do know something. You do know that all people are sinners and that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead. You know that because you've heard this from this pulpit many, many times. And should the Lord take me tonight, I am innocent of everyone who's been here, of their blood, because you have heard the gospel from this pulpit. And so if you've heard the gospel, have you trusted in Jesus. I beg you. Listen. You forget everything I say. Está bien. I beg you. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. He's the one that died for all of your sins. All of your sins. Past, present, future. No matter how big, how ugly. He paid for them. That's the power of the blood of Christ. Into eternity, he played, he paid for all of your sins. And now he offers this, will you trust me? Will you believe in me as your Savior? I pray that right now you make the biggest decision you can ever make if you've never trusted in Jesus. Will you? Right now. And if you have, it's a simple thing to say, Lord, I cannot save myself, but right now, I'm deciding to put my faith in you, trusting that you paid for all of my sins, will you? So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Let my love look like you and what you made.